Hi, my name is Sarah Hooper. I am the Executive Director of the UCSF UC Hastings Consortium on Law, Science, and Health Policy and Adjunct Faculty at UC Hastings College of the Law. So today I'm going to provide a basic introduction to the law. Um, I will not be providing any specific legal advice. For that, you should consult your institutional policies um, or your institutional counsel. Um, I also am not providing any statements about UCSF's institutional policy about the End of Life Option Act um, or providers who choose to participate in the Act. So let's start with what is the End of Life Option Act. This is a new law effective June 9th, 2016 in California. It permits prescription of an aid in dying drug in specific circumstances. Um, the law itself provides a very specific process um, and includes specific documents that must be used. Um, and the law clarifies that physicians who engage in activities under the End of Life Options Act um, are not assisting in a suicide or active euthanasia or mercy killing. And patients are not committing suicide if they uh, request an aid in dying drug and take the drug. The law provides immunity to physicians who assist patients in obtaining and ingesting the aid in dying drug. So who can request this drug? A patient must be 18 years of age or older, a California resident, must have a terminal illness defined as an incurable or irreversible illness with a prognosis of six months or less. The patient must have capacity for medical decisions and must have the ability to self-administer and also must be able to pursue and follow all of the steps required in the law. So um, some questions about which patients uh, might be able to request this drug and who might be able to request on their behalf. The short answer is that only patients directly may request the aid in dying drug. Caregivers, family members, healthcare agents, and conservators are not permitted to request aid in dying on behalf of the patient. And patients can also not request aid in dying through an advanced directive or pulsed. Now some patients with a diagnosis of a mental disorder or a disease affecting cognitive function may still be eligible to request the drug. In California, diagnosis alone does not equal incapacity. A full capacity assessment is required to determine if the patient lacks capacity for this specific decision. Um, the law also clarifies the request for the drug alone is not a basis for incapacity, and a request for the drug alone is not en enough uh, to provide the basis for guardianship or conservatorship. So I'll provide a high-level overview of the process, and then I'll walk through some of the steps uh, providing more detail. So first, a patient would request uh, the drug from an attending physician and have a discussion with the attending physician. The patient would then be required to get a second opinion from a consulting physician. If either the attending physician or the consulting physician uh, believes that assessment by a mental health specialist would be needed, the patient would be referred to a mental health specialist as well. If the attending physician determines that the patient has met all of the legal steps, the attending physician could then provide a prescription directly or through a pharmacy. Once the patient receives the aid in dying drug, the patient can, de can decide when to self-administer the drug and can change their mind any time regardless of capacity. And finally, documentation uh, in the medical chart as well as with specific forms is required throughout. So next, I'll talk about the process of requesting aid in dying from an attending physician. An attending physician is the primary physician with responsibility for treatment of the patient. The patient must make two oral requests at least 15 days apart directly to the attending physician and one request in writing that needs to be witnessed by independent witnesses and signed by the patient. Again, the request must be made directly to the physician without others present so that the physician can determine that the patient is not making this request subject to undue influence or coercion. If the patient needs an interpreter, an interpreter can be present, but that interpreter needs to be someone who is independent 
and not related to the patient by blood, marriage, or adoption, or entitled to inherit a portion of the patient's estate. Once a physician receives a request from a patient, the physician must determine if the patient is qualified uh, to receive the aid in dying drug. And a qualified patient, as I mentioned before, is a patient who is over the age of 18, a California resident, has a terminal uh, diagnosis, and who has mental capacity to make this decision. The physician will have a counseling and informed consent discussion um, that is quite detailed in the law, um, but the highlights include a discussion of the diagnosis and the prognosis with the patient, the potential risks of taking the drug, the probable result of taking the drug, and alternatives such as hospice and palliative care. And the physician needs to remind the patient that he or she has the ability to receive but not take the drug, that once they receive the drug, they are not obligated to take it if they change their mind. The attending physician will need to make a capacity determination. Um, and again, if the attending physician determines that there are indicia of a mental disorder, then they might want to refer to a mental health specialist um, who can do, uh, who can assist in making that capacity determination. And finally, the attending physician will need to refer to the consulting physician who will provide a second opinion. Now, do attending physicians have to participate in this process? The answer under the Act is no. Any individual provider can decline to participate for reasons of conscience, morality, or ethics. And the law clarifies that participation includes providing information about rights under the Act. But you should be aware of a law in California called the Right to Know End of Life Options Act which indicates that providers shall give information about care options to terminally ill patients. Now this act was passed before aid in dying was legal in California, and when read together, uh, it appears that physicians are still required to give information about care options, except that they're not required to provide information about aid in dying if they object to doing so. The Act also permits institutions to prohibit individual providers from participating in the Act while on the premises or within the scope of contract or employment. Institutions must provide advance notice of the policy, and the law clarifies that institutions may not prohibit physicians or others from providing a diagnosis or a prognosis, from discussing uh, options under the Act, including providing counseling about the end-of-life option, um, and cannot prohibit physicians from referring to another provider who can help the patient um, with this request. It is important to note here that for VA providers, VA law is federal law and in general supersedes California law. However, the VA has not issued any guidance on this subject, so while we know that the VA prohibits providers from prescribing um, aid in dying, it is not entirely clear how far this prohibition extends. Once an attending physician has met with a patient, they will need to refer to a consulting physician. A consulting physician under the law needs to be a physician who is independent. However, the law does not define what independent means. The law does say that the consulting physician cannot be someone who is related by blood, marriage, or adoption to the patient or someone who is entitled to a portion of the patient's estate upon their death. The consulting physician will have the responsibility to examine the patient and the patient's medical record to provide an opinion as to the patient's diagnosis and prognosis, provide an opinion as to the patient's capacity to make this decision, um, and also has an independent duty to assess for whether a mental health specialist um, might be needed to assist in the capacity determination. The consulting physician will be required to complete documentation as well under the law. Okay, so let's talk about the mental health specialist. A mental health specialist in the law is either a psychiatrist or a licensed psychologist. Again, the consult with a mental health specialist is optional and is at the discretion of the attending or consulting physician. 
The mental health specialist will be required to examine the patient and all of their relevant medical records, and this can occur over one or more visits. And the mental health specialist is to determine that the patient has capacity and determine that the patient's judgment is not impaired by a mental disorder. If the attending physician confirms that all legal requirements have been met, he or she can directly dispense the drug if they are authorized to do so, or a pharmacist can dispense directly to the patient, attending physician, or another person the patient designates for this purpose, or can dispense by mail, and a signature would be required on delivery if that is the method. The attending physician would then be required to report to the California Department of Public Health within 30 days of writing the prescription. Once the patient receives the drug, he or she can decide when and whether to take the drug and can change their mind at any time regardless of capacity. Others can help prepare the drug, but the patient must be able to physically take the drug on their own. The law specifies that patients cannot take the drug in a public place, meaning a public park or another gathering place, not a hospital. Others, including providers who assisted the patient in obtaining the drug, may choose to attend when the patient decides to take the drug. Patients are required to fill out and sign a final attestation form that states that the patient took the drug voluntarily and was not subject to coercion or undue influence in doing so. If the patient decides to take the drug, the attending physician must report to the California Department of Public Health within 30 days of the patient's death. The California Department of Public Health will not release any identifying patient information in the data that they keep about the End of Life Option Act. The law does not clarify what the cause of death should be on the death certificate for a patient who decides to take an aid in dying drug. However, it does make clear that this act is not considered suicide, and so the word suicide would not be appropriate for the death certificate. For liability and insurance purposes, the law also clarifies that the patient death is not considered suicide, assisted suicide, homicide, or elder abuse. So the provider who has followed all of the steps in the law and their institutional policies should not be subject to criminal or civil liability or professional sanction. And patients, patients' estates and their family members cannot be subject to discrimination from health insurance, life insurance, and other companies on the basis that they requested or followed through with aid in dying. So those are the basics of the California End of Life Option Act. For additional resources about the law, I recommend that you consult your local institutional policies. You can check out the fact sheet and link to the full text of the California law at www.ucconsortium.org. The California Medical Association also has fact sheets on the law that are available at www.cmanet.org slash resource dash library. And finally, the American Bar Association and the American Psychological Association have released joint handbooks on capacity assessment for clinicians and for lawyers that are available at www.apa.org. I hope this overview has been helpful and thank you. Mm -hmm.